Hello Year 11 and welcome to another lockdown lesson of English, focusing on the terrifying delight that is It by Stephen King. We're following on from yesterday's lesson which was focusing on question two. So our plan of action for today is to do some quick review questions as a starter, then we'll begin to look at question three. A lot of us don't feel particularly confident with this question. Um, we, we know language analysis, we've been doing it for years, but structure we find a little bit more difficult, which is why we're going to spend a whole lesson looking at strategies for how best to respond to this task. So that's our plan for today. Okay, little review question. So same as last time, you can either pause it as we go, try and write down the answers, just think about them, or be super lazy and wait for me to go through them. I'd recommend one of the first two options. So what is question three? What skills does it require? How many marks is it worth? How much time should you spend on question three? Name five structural features you could discuss for question three. What's question four? What skills does it require? How many marks is it worth? How long should you spend on it? And five features you could discuss for question four. So as a little recap, pause the video now either think about the answers or write them down somewhere and come back when you've done it. Okay, question three focuses on structure. It requires your analysis skills. It's worth eight marks and you should probably spend about 10 to 12 minutes on it. Structural features you could talk about could include foreshadowing, pace, shift of focus, juxtaposition, um, tension, analepsis, anything like that. Question four is focusing on the whole text and it requires evaluation. You are making a judgment, you're given a statement, you have to say to what extent you agree with it. It's worth 20 marks. You should probably spend between 20 and 25 minutes on it. And as we're looking more holistically, you can discuss any language or structural features or you could be a little bit more open. You could talk about character descriptions, the genre, um, the atmosphere that's created, anything like that. Okay, so that was just a quick recap of paper one. Question three is this. Oh, it's, yeah, it's from the beginning of a novel. I panicked. So it's from the beginning of a novel. How does the writer structure the text to interest you as a reader? So you can think about what your attention is focused on at the beginning, how and why the writer changes this focus and any other structural features. What I'd like you to do is just to write down the question in the middle. So how has the writer structured the text to interest you as a reader? Pause it now, write it down, and then come back. Okay, this is the slide the vast majority of you hate. If you are feeling quite confident and you're happy to work through the structural features independently, what I would recommend you do is pause it on this slide, um, work your way through the text, and then skip a few minutes to the next section of the tape. Tape, so old. If you are not feeling particularly confident, what I'm going to do is use those questions as a basis and I'm going to reread the extract, verbalising my ideas and talking you through what sort of structural features I might point out and I'll put my annotations on as well. So it's up to you. If you're feeling confident, pause it here, work your way through independently. If you'd like a bit more support, then just keep watching the video. Okay. So the things I'm going to be focusing on are what's the writer focusing my attention on straight away, how is it developed, what structural feature is it and why has the writer done it. So I'm going to read each extract or each part of the extract and talk you through my ideas as we go. The terror, which would not end for another 28 years if it ever did end, began so far as I know or can tell with a boat made from a sheet of newspaper floating down a gutter swollen with rain. So immediately as a reader, we're expecting something terrible to happen. It literally begins the book with the terror, but it juxtaposes it with something seemingly quite innocent, like a little kind of child's paper boat. So already we're on edge. We're not, we're not quite sure what to expect, um, but we know that something bad's going to happen. The boat bobbed, listed, righted itself again, dived bravely through the treacherous whirlpools and continued on its way down Witcham Street towards the traffic light which marked the intersection of Witcham and Jackson. The three vertical lenses on all sides of the traffic light were dark this afternoon in the fall of 1957, and the houses were all dark too. There had been steady rain for a week now, 
and two days ago the winds had come as well. Most sections of Derry had lost their power then and it was not back on yet. So we've kind of got this shift of focus. So we've got this kind of overarching idea of terror at the beginning and then we're focusing on that boat. And again, because we know that something terrible is going to happen, when it's revealed to us that the traffic lights are dark, they're not working and the houses are dark too, so there's no power, we immediately think, okay, well, perhaps there's gonna be some sort of road traffic collision because the lights are out, maybe something terrible is going to happen. So there's this significance of darkness. And again, it foreshadows what could happen later, but we're not quite sure yet, which is why it makes it even more unnerving. Lots of juxtaposition here. So we've gone from darkness to the next paragraph, a small boy in a yellow slicker and red galoshes ran cheerfully along beside the newspaper boat. The rain had not stopped, but it was finally slackening. It tapped on the yellow hood of the boy's slicker, sounding to his ears like rain on a shed roof. A comfortable, almost cosy sound. The boy in the yellow slicker was George Denver. He was six. His brother William, known to most of the kids at Derry Elementary School, and even to the teachers who would have never used the nickname to his face, as stuttering Bill, was at home, hacking out the last of a nasty case of influenza. In the autumn, in that autumn of 1957, eight months before the real horrors began, and 28 years before the final showdown, Stuttering Bill was 10 years old. So we've kind of got reference to these, these kind of horrible things. So you've got the nasty case of flu. So you're thinking, is, is that the terrible thing? But then it's revealed that it's eight months before the real horrors began. So we're wondering what the traffic lights, what the child, what the rain could have to do with, with the terror. And it's building it up, not really giving us a lot of information. It's leaving it very ambiguous. It seems like a lot of detail um, for no apparent reason. It's unnerving. Okay, so the next things to focus on. What main points of focus does the writer develop in sequence after the starting point? How is it developed? Why is the writer doing that? And how is it specific to my understanding? How does it help me relate to the text? Bill had made the boat beside which George now ran. That was awful reading, sorry. Bill had made the boat beside which George now ran. He'd made it sitting up in bed, his back propped against a pile of pillows while their mother played fairies on the piano in the parlour and rain swept restlessly against his bedroom window. And all I've said here is, when I was thinking about why the writer included that paragraph about kind of Bill resting at home somewhere, I wonder if the writer included it to remind us that George, who's six, is, is seemingly without his brother Bill, and that makes us wonder who's supervising him. And again, it puts us on edge. It makes us wonder what's going to happen. Is something terrible going to happen to George? The traffic lights, the rain? Again, we're not sure. And it all seems like these really kind of mundane details that don't mean a lot, but that adds to the unsettling atmosphere. About three quarters of the way down the block as one headed toward the intersection of a dead traffic light, Witcham Street was blocked to motor traffic by smudge pots and four orange sawhorses. Stenciled across each of the horses was Derry Department of Public Works. Beyond them, the rain had spilled out of the gutters clogged with branches and rocks and big sticky piles of autumn leaves. The water had first pried finger holes in the paving and then snatched whole greedy handfuls, all of this by the third day of the rains. By noon of the fourth day, big chunks of the street's surface were boating through the intersection of Jackson and Witcham, like miniature white water rafts. By that time, many people in Derry had begun to make nervous jokes about arcs. The public works department had managed to keep Jackson Street open, but Witcham was impassable from the sawhorses all the way to the centre of town. So again, we're reminded of the traffic, we're reminded of the issues there. But everyone agreed the worst was over. And again, we get this sense of irony because we know, it's, it's, I suppose it's almost dramatic irony in a way, we know that something's terrible, something terrible's going to happen because we were told right at the beginning, but the characters are seemingly unaware. The Kenderskeeg stream had crested just below its banks in the barrens and bare inches below the concrete sides of the canal which channeled it tightly as it passed through downtown. Right now, a gang of men, Zach Denver, George and Bill's father among them, were removing the sandbags they had thrown up the day before with such panicky haste. Yesterday overflow and expensive flood damage had seemed almost inevitable. God knew it had happened before. The flooding in 1931 had been a disaster which had cost millions of dollars and almost two dozen lives. That was a long time ago but there were still enough people who remembered it to scare the rest. One of the flood victims had been found 25 miles east in Bucksport. The fish had eaten this unfortunate gentleman's eyes, three of his fingers and most of his left foot. Clutched in what remained of his hands had been a Ford steering wheel. And again, I'm thinking, more victims? Is it to do with the terror? Um, could these two events be linked somehow? 
Now though the river was receding, and when the new Bangor Hydro Dam went in upstream, the river would cease to be a threat, or so said Zach Denbra, who worked for Bangor Hydroelectric. As for the rest, well, future floods could take care of themselves. The thing was to get through this one, to get the power back on, and then to forget it. In Derry, such forgetting of tragedy and disaster was almost an art, as Bill Denbra would come to discover in the course of time. So we know that something terrible is going to happen to this family. Um, something awful, but even though it's foreshadowing these events, it's leaving us um, in the darkness. We, we don't know what's going to happen. Okay, so final paragraphs. What is the writer focusing our attention on at the end of the texts? How am I left thinking or feeling at the end? And why has the writer done that in the opening of the text? George paused just before the saw horses at the end of a deep ravine that had been cut through the tar surface of Witcham Street. This ravine ran on almost exact diagonal. It ended on the far side of the street, roughly 40 feet farther down the hill from where he now stood on the right. He laughed aloud, the sound of solitary childish glee, a bright runner in that grey afternoon, as a vagary of flowing water took his paper boat into a scale model rapids which had been formed by the break in the tar. The urgent water had cut a channel which ran along the diagonal, and so his boat travelled from one side of Witcham Street to the other, the current carrying it so fast that George had to sprint to keep up with it. Water sprayed out from beneath his galoshes in muddy sheets. The buckles made a jolly jingling as George Denver ran towards his strange death. Just chuck that in there. Gonna die. And the feeling which filled him at that moment was clear and simple love for his brother Bill. Love and a touch of regret that Bill couldn't be here to see, and see this and be part of it. Of course he would try to describe it to Bill when he got home. But he knew he wouldn't be able to make him see it the way Bill would have been able to make him see it if their positions had been reversed. Bill was good at reading and writing, but even at his age, George was wise enough to know that this wasn't the only reason why Bill got A's on his report cards, or why his teachers liked his composition so much. Telling was only part of it, Bill was good at seeing. And just in that paragraph, you've got this really dismissive mention of George's death, this innocent six-year-old. And it's kind of chucked in there, right in the middle of this a kind of um, excessively detailed paragraph. And then it's skimmed over and it moves on. And we've got the comparison between the two brothers and that idea of, of tragedy. It talks about their positions having been reversed. And I wonder if that might be significant too. Final paragraph. The boat nearly whistled along the diagonal channel, just a page torn from the classified section of the Derry News. But now George imagined it as a PT boat in a war movie, like the ones he sometimes saw down at the Derry Theatre with Bill at Saturday matinees. A war picture with John Wayne fighting, the prow of a newspaper boat threw sprays of water to either side as it rushed along, and then it reached the gutter on the left side of Witcham Street, a fresh stream that rushed over the break in the tar at that point, creating a fairly large whirlpool, and it seemed to him that the boat must be swamped and capsized. It leaned alarmingly. And then George cheered as it righted itself, turned and went racing on down towards the intersection. George sprinted to catch up. Over his head, a grim gust of October wind rattled the trees, now almost completely unburdened of their freight of coloured leaves by the storm, which had this year, which had been this year, a reaper of the most ruthless sort. Um, and something else I'd like to talk about is this menacing undertone throughout the whole of the text. You've got references uh, to the reaper, you've got references to... Um, I don't know, capsizing, war, um, there's other violent imagery that I noticed, um, but really helpfully I haven't highlighted, but it's just this sinister atmosphere throughout, but you can't quite put your finger on why. So what I've basically done is verbalise my thought processes structurally as we've been reading through the text. And after I do that, after I've annotated, and I will put this up for you to see, but what I find really helpful is rather than just focusing on paragraph by paragraph, taking a step back and thinking, right, overall, holistically, how has the writer structured this? What structural features stand out to me as particularly effective? Um, and for me, it's, it's the kind of the shift of focus between um, the rain and George, the rain and George. Um, you kind of know the two at some point are going to collide for some reason. Obviously, he's in the rain, but you know what I mean? It's, it's going to be the cause of some sort of issue. Um, there's also the juxtaposition between this dark, kind of gloomy street and all the rain and this bright, innocent child. And finally, that foreshadowing all the way throughout, like the sinister undertone. And I think those are three really powerful techniques that the writer uses. So I'll show you my annotations in a sec. But 
what I think would be really helpful is after this to take the time, 25, 30 minutes, to really plan your question through response. Um, I'm not going to make you write it today because why not? We've got time. So plan it, make it really good. Um, for question three, it's only worth eight marks, but it's worth trying to get them. So if you're stuck for how to structure it, ironically, go for beginning, middle, end. So I'm just going to show you my annotations and then I'll let you get on. Okay, so all I've done is upload a picture of my annotations, which is pretty much what I said to you throughout the whole thing. So if you want to pause it here and just have a better look, that's absolutely fine. But all I've highlighted is structural stuff I could use um, and I've just annotated it as I've gone so that I know what I could go back and talk about. So for the rest of this lesson, your job is to plan a really decent question three response and then next time we're going to write it. Email me if you have any questions. As always, take care.